Okay. So, um, cause we'll send this recording out to everybody. So um, just to recap uh, a little more quickly, just wanna welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and, and gratitude for my ancestors and my teachers, Melodum, Rocking Bear, um, and their teachers before them, and um, and all the ones uh, who enable me to do this work. Um, and when we talk about invocation, we'll talk about that that process of what an invocation is and what how it's relative to offering divination. Um, so I'm very grateful for all of my teachers and their teachers um, that have enabled me to sit here and share this with you. So as I was saying, in the cosmology of the Dogger tribe of West Africa, to be born into the village means that you came into this village uh, because you're bringing a gift, you're bringing medicine. That's why you come. Um, it would be as if you looked around the realm of the ancestors before coming here, and you said, there's this kind of trouble down there, and I, and I have this gift and I want to bring it. And then you look around your ancestral realm and you say, and I'm gonna need your help and your help and your help and your help because you carry this medicine too. And so when I get down there, we have to stay in conversation because I can't do this by myself. And that's a real important key uh, to a diviner. You're not doing this by yourself. Um, so it requires relationship uh, with those helping spirits to enable this process. Um, so arriving here, bringing the gift of medicine that you came here to deliver. And it would be understood that you also carry the proportional amount of power to deliver this medicine. Um, however, after about four or five years, as often the case in childhood, when that really soft spot in the brain starts closing up, um, forgetting sets in. And, uh, and so we begin to forget those agreements, those conversations we had with the other world. Those of you that have spent time with little children, you'll notice up until about that age, they often uh, will relay information um, from that realm and, and through things that they say. Um, so after a particular amount of time in, the, in this world, those things we begin to forget. And then uh, we take on the um, predominant myths of our society or culture. Um, there's a poem I have called Follow Your Name. <clears throat> and uh, there's a phrase in there that says, if you, were not, if you were not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. And the life you know you must live is the one standing a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself and walk to the horizon of your own dreams, the place where you stand in the absence of those old stories, the place where the sharp edges of this moment demand your full attention. Where are you? You are, I am here, you say. Who are you? I am this moment, you reply. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not show up in the world in such a way that you allow others to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not show up in the world in such a way that you allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. I don't know if you'd be interested in this. Sorry. Can we cut off the speakers? Thank you. <clears throat> um, so it speaks of this, this uh, more of indigenous cosmological animus understanding of reality that community includes the realm of the ancestors, those behind us, those in front of us, in a, in a distinct relationship with them and coming here. So this is uh, foundational to really understanding divination. Uh, so this, this uh, divination is to realign you, to reconnect you with uh, that medicine, those memories, 
by addressing and looking at any difficulties, challenges, obstacles that are interfering uh, with the delivery of that medicine. And those could be ancestral, they could be uh, from within your own life, but often uh, even those things have their, their roots and seeds in an earlier uh, time. Um, and so this understand we come into the world to, uh, to remember. And so divination is a way of uh, having that conversation um, to uncover such things. Um, the first divination one would have in Meldoma's village would actually be before you were born. The shaman, the diviner, would sit with, the, with your, your mom and divine and listen and see if they could divine your name and what it was you were coming here with so we would know what to call you. Um, because your name carries a frequency of, of uh, medicine in and of itself. So these things are, are foundational to understanding divination. Um, the other thing that's different about divination reading than all the thousands and thousands of forms of way of doing divination or cowrie shell divination, um, the thing that's unique to this particular form of cowrie shell divination is that it's not simply to give you information. It's to examine uh, what's going on in your life now, what you have questions about, and then to offer you ritual prescriptions to then enact as engaging a conversation yourself with the other world. So we say when there's trouble in this world, it means there's already been trouble in the other world. And if we don't include that in our uh, remedy through ritual, then we're only you know, putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, so the... Um, so a story, just to share a little story with you about uh, what could come up in a divination. Um, the way I like to approach divination is I like just to get several questions and your birth information, and that's all. I don't want to. I don't want to actually know any of the story um, uh, because it can. It, uh, there's a tendency in our culture and, and uh, to psychologize everything. And, and this is not a psychologicalization of your situation. Um, and so with a few questions, um, we, go in, we do an invocation. And as I said earlier, invocation is how we begin. Invocation is um, calling on my helping spirits and your helping spirits to open the way for what needs to unfold here. Um, and then, uh, then we move into the reading. Once uh, in, in this format, if you unless you were sitting in front of me across my table here, which you'll see in just a moment, um, I'll place my hand on the shelves. Actually, I'll show you this like that, and I'd spin the shelves, and you tell me when to stop, and then I would stop, and then I'll start reading the conversations. So earlier I was talking about if you were born into the Earth Clan. Earth is in the center of this wheel, and it is uh, that place of belonging, place of, of uh, connection, place of community within yourself, within your community. Um, this realm over here is the realm of fire. That is, if you are born into the, your birth year ends with a two or a seven, where say you're born in the fire clan, and therefore in uh Within the ritual processes of the village, you are responsible for uh, maintaining uh, connection with the realm of the ancestors by tending the fire. So fire is also represented the realm of the ancestors. Um, if you're born uh, on this area here, this white area is mineral and minerals, the stones, the bones. It's about communication, information, um, transponder and transceiver within the worlds and between the worlds. And so if you're born with the last uh, year of your birth ending with a four or nine, we say you're in the mineral clan. This area here is the realm of water. Uh, there's deep water and river water. And if you're born with the last year of your birth being that of one or six, you'd be born into the water clan. And, that would, and so you would be responsible for the water shrine within rituals. And if you're born in this area over here is considered the nature clan, that would be 
if the last year of your birth were three or eight. Um, let's say you're a nature clan person. So nature clan people are responsible for the gateways, the doorways, the thresholds, the portals, the betwixt and between places within ritual. Um, the mineral clan people are, uh, are hold the, the realm of information and communication within the world, between the worlds. The water clan people bring ease and flow and, and peace and healing. Um, and so there's different uh, elemental identities that you are born with and therefore certain gifts of medicine that we automatically know you have. Um, all of these items you see here um, have different, uh, have information associated with them. Um, and uh, when we begin the divination, let's say like this item here, this is the, um, the elemental fire stone and as we also call it the ancestor stone. Um, now by itself, that's just what it is. But when this ancestor stone sits, ends up here, and say uh, this bone ends up here and uh, this piece ends up here. Well, that's a conversation. And it's a conversation because they're sitting in mineral. Um, they're connected to the, the shrine called Barrow Shrine, which is a protector of the delivery of medicine. And it's up against an obstacle here. This is an obstacle stone. So I'd say, and looking at this by itself, I'd say there's there's some obstacle of information from the realm of the ancestors uh, that also has this protection around it. Um, but nonetheless, there's something here that needs to be addressed in order to let this flow through into your life. So we, we look at these things in terms of uh, information. Um, so that's how we how I go about reading the spread. Um, this is also a, um, not just an infra, uh, uh, a deep dive into cowrie shell divination, actually experiencing one, uh, but also the uh, the upcoming uh, apprenticeship in cowrie shell divination, which is um, begins in July and ends in October, end of October. There's a three sessions, and one of the sessions we focus on um, enhancing intuitive tracking, remote viewing, uh, energy awareness, um, and working with the ancestors and understanding the realm of the ancestors and the difference between uh, what we'd call well ancestors and unwell ancestors, um, and how to work with those those lines, those lineages uh, for for assistance and to offer healing. Uh, the second part of divination training is um, a deep dive into the elementals, uh, where we de develop deep relationship with each of the elementals, and we talk about and do the teachings around what are called the different faces of each one. Like there are many faces to to fire. One is grandfather fire. One is fire as a doorway of communication with ancestors. One is fire as a transformative medicine. One is fire as a clearing agent. So there, we just go over each of the elementals offer uh, unique expressions that uh, are in ritual. And then we also teach that uh, uh, information around the medicine wheel that there are um, precise reasons why you would prescribe a water ritual versus a fire ritual versus a mineral or nature or earth or ancestor. Like there are, there are particular things going on with people that would indicate why you would prescribe that kind of ritual. Now in divination, a lot of it is divined, but it can also be uh, understood without the divination spread, just in terms of knowing the cosmology and the medicine wheel. Um, so that if somebody had a, uh, a challenge of uh, not feeling welcome, not feeling safe, not feeling uh, confident to really show up in their own life, what I, how I map that into the medicine wheel is like, oh, that's a, that's a dilemma of the gatekeeper between the North and the South. And that particular gatekeeper requires rituals that will involve air uh, or 
uh, more likely rituals that will involve earth and may even be about ancestors. Uh, so there's a way you, you organize that information in your mind so you have a deep understanding about a person's dilemma and what ritual prescriptions actually address those things. Um, so here's an example. Um, it's doing divination with uh, a man from uh, the UK. And the pre presenting issue was that when um, he had purchased this land and this home to have a like a retreat center. And the issue was that when he, whenever he was there, he felt really depressed. And whenever he was out traveling, he felt really good. And he couldn't understand, why do I feel really depressed when I go home? Um, so as the, the divination unfolded, um, the, the images and things that were coming through, and I asked him certain, certain questions based on what I was seeing, I said, uh, is there um, a cemetery by chance uh, near you, maybe across a river? And he said, yeah, there's one across the river. And I said, okay, that's one thing that we need to look at. I said, and then I saw the image of um, bones in the earth, like dark soil and a shovel turning over white bones. And I said, is there, um, is there uh, well, first I said, this is gonna sound like a peculiar question, uh, but I need to ask, is there any story about anyone ever being buried on your land? And they said, well, funny you should ask. Yes, it's about 150 years old that there's a story that goes with this land that, um, that this uh, uh, husband and wife, um, uh, the, the, the wife got pregnant out of the marriage and, but they decided to keep the child but the child didn't survive, died very early. And um, and then and then the child was buried on the land. And so as we're talking, um, the person has the awareness that that's his story. That he too, just like that child, had the same same story of how he was born, but he survived. And I said, well, no wonder you are there, because you're there to help this little one cross over. And that's what you're, that's part of the big depression you're feeling. That's like the soul hasn't crossed over. Um, and now we'll, you know, I can, we can talk about the rituals to assist this one in crossing over so the land is clear again. Um, and so he did those and it cleared up and, and then he started having people, you know, a retreat center where people would come and stay when they were traveling. And um, another, um, Another one that comes to mind, uh, a lady, uh, this one came to me in person and they said um, they were feeling some grief and they didn't know why it's been there a long time, it's a couple of years, they've been feeling it. There was a relationship that ended a couple of years ago, but it was over um, and they didn't understand why this grief was still there. They felt like they should be through it, but it was heavy and it was just not letting go. Um, and so through the divination, what came out of, uh, and she said, like, I need to know how to like process this, this grief. Well, what came out of the divination, um, as I said, are you, based on uh, certain items and how they feel, I said, um, are you, do you have a relationship? Uh, do you have uh, a Scots, uh, Scottish ancestors? Yes. Do you have a relationship um, to the McDonald clan um, in Scotland. Yes. I said, oh, I said, you know, um, that clan was massacred. And there's a story there in the Glencoe Valley about how that happened. And what appears is that this loss has activated this ancestral grief. Um, and the ritual prescription is that for you to go travel to Glastonbury, England, gather some uh, water from the chalice well there in Glastonbury, and then go to Scotland in this, and find this cave and go there and make an offering uh, of healing uh, for your animals. Um, so the things that come out of divination can be very brief, like going to your backyard and do this, or, you know, 
and I can't promise what will come out, what information comes out. Um, but the information again, as a, um, another way of, uh, for me, divination, when people say, you know, where does, how does the information come through? And I said, well, it's, it's best if I talk faster than I think. Because once I start thinking, it's a tendency to, to overanalyze. And with a psycho psychology background, I can get into kind of psychologically creating an awareness of what I think is going on. Um, not that it could be inaccurate, um, but what I find is when I'm just reading the conversation and saying what I'm seeing, that I'm talking faster than I think, and I'm, I'm less at risk of polluting the information with analysis. Um, so that's one of the, the techniques that, uh, that I, when I train people, it's like, yeah, you just, you just start talking. You, you have to have good relationship with your allies and trust them what they tell you and just start saying what you see in the conversations. Don't worry about it if it makes sense. Um, every now and then I'll be talking and I'll, there's part of me, my mind that's thinking this is like, I don't even know if this makes any sense to this person. Um, but after a little bit of conversation, I'll stop and I'll say, so tell me what you hear. What are you resonating with? What makes sense to you? What questions you have? Um, is there anything that's been said that you have any connection to? And then other things come out. Um, had a man one time that, uh, um, no, I won't tell that story. Skip that one. Um, Let's see if any other one wants to come up right now. Oh, my favorite one. So sometimes I do these uh, for um, for space. You can do a divination on the on the soul of a place or a home or a land, and it's a similar process. I go into the and in this case was going to a house, um, and uh, a friend of mine that's a. a, a very successful real estate agent in the area called me and she calls me every now and then says, you go check out this house. I don't know what's, what's happening here. So she had called me about this house and it turned out the house belonged to her fiance at that time. And, um, or maybe they had just got, no, it's her fiance. That's right. They hadn't been married yet. And, um, and he had been married before, but his wife had died of cancer. Um, and she died in that house. And so when they got together and they were moving in together, they were deciding to sell, to sell his house. Um, it was a beautiful home, but it wouldn't, wouldn't sell. And she had the sense something you know, could be going on there. So I went in and, and uh, went, into the, went into the house. Um, and in those situations, I kind of begin divining right away by just listening and, and seeing what shows up. Um, and so I walked into the room that the woman had died in, which was a sunroom. And my first feeling was, this is a, an amazing room. This is beautiful. If I, matter of fact, if I was to die in this house, this is the room I would want to be in. It's, it's just, there's plants, there's sunlight, it's, it's, it's great. So I walked all around the bottom of the house and I didn't feel anything. I said, you know, it feels actually really good in here. And then I went upstairs and there was a landing. And at the top of the landing, I could see kind of back here, there were two doors that went to a bedroom here and a bedroom here. And then over here, there was a bedroom there and then a bedroom over there. And then around behind me, there was another bedroom. And, um, and so I started walking into each room, just divining what I could see. And, and sense in those rooms. And um, I'd gone through all the rooms. Then I walked to the two rooms back here and I stood between the two rooms. And I looked down and I saw, what I thought I saw was a reddish brown stain on the carpet. But when I looked again, there was nothing there. So I just took note of that. And then I went and stood on that spot and I turned around and I looked out and, um, and I felt this tremendous grief come over me. And then when I, what, it, what occurred to me is from that one spot that I was standing, I could see into all of her children's rooms from that position. And I just had the overwhelming sense that she must have stood here holding that knowledge, knowing that she's going to have to share this. Um, so I went in one of those rooms and began the divination. Um, and what came to me first was this word called melody. 
And I thought, okay, just, I don't know what that's about, but I'll, I'll put, file that away and may come back to it. And as the divination unfolded, what I saw was a, a relationship between her and this younger woman. Um, and she was like a mentor or a, um, a teacher for this younger lady, younger meaning like in her twenties. Um, and, um, and then I felt the presence of the woman herself in the bedroom. And I felt like I was in the presence of royalty. Like this is a woman of high standing, incredible, uh, just ethics. And I just, it felt like a very noble person, um, highly respected kind of energy. And I said, do you need anything? And she said, no, which is one of the indicators of well ancestors, by the way, they don't need anything from us. <laughs> the unwell dead need a lot. So that's, you have to kind of discern that when you're working with the dead. Um, no, so I continue doing the divination and I'm seeing this relationship. And then uh, the name Emily comes to me. And I thought, okay, Emily. And then there's a message that says, um, uh, uh, what was it? Tell, tell Emily uh, to be brave. And so I have a stone on my thread, on my spread here that has the word courage on it. It may show up tonight. And so I, I said, oh, the courage stone, where's the courage stone? I start looking and then the message comes in. No, I didn't say courage. I said, be brave. I said, okay, not courage, be brave. Got it. Um, so Emily, so I got to find Emily, um, tell her to be brave. And, and, uh, and she's in some kind of relationship hell is what I've kind of gathered. Um, so I was about to close up the divination. And I said, if there's anything else, I'm not going to think about this once I end it. So tell me now, because once I uh, close the space, I'm going to stop thinking about this and just report back what I've got. And, um, and then the word Melody came back around. I said, oh, Melody. I said, well, maybe it, that's not a name. Maybe it's a, like a song. And I literally just, my phone, which is an interesting thing you can do these days. <laughs> and I opened up my phone and I put Be Brave song lyrics. And this song, as some of you may nod in your head, may know this song by Sarah, Sarah Borales called Brave. And I, and I just tapped the, tapped the phone. I listened to the song and it was, and it made me weep. It was like somebody was talking to this. It was like the conversation between the dead woman and the young lady. Like your days of silence are over. You need to tell him what you think, tell him the truth, be brave, speak it. Um, and, uh, and I just, oh, that's the message. Um, so I contacted the lady. I said, this is different. Um, somehow I got, there's an Emily, is there an Emily? And she didn't know. She said, I'll need to ask my fiance. And he and comes back next day. Yes, there's an Emily. Uh, yes, his wife was like a mentor to her. And um, he hasn't seen her since his, his wife died. Um, she was engaged to somebody to be married and he didn't like him. Matter of fact, his words were, he was an asshole and I didn't like him is what he said. <laughs> um, and, um, and she said, you know, I've passed that information on. He'll see if she can find, he can find her. Well, he did find her um, and set up a meeting and met with her and played her this song. And uh, when he played the song, um, she said her words back was, um, that's so like Melody to tell me this. And she said, tell them that I realized this person was not good for me and I ended the relationship I got out. Um, so all that got transferred and then the, uh, and then the house sold. Um, and that was one of those situations that I asked uh, my friend, I said, can I share this story? This is a, you know, I feel like I was so fortunate just being uh, in, a passer of information, the message person. Um, but it was quite an incredible thing. And so I would definitely say over the years, um, divining just continues to, um, I just say, wow, you know, it's just, it's just gratitude. And truly it's not me. It's, it's, um, as my other teachers, Rocking Bear would say, you know, when you, be when you begin this work or when you get into this work, First, you'll learn protocols. 
And then I'm going to tell you to forget all those protocols. And now you're responsible for paying attention. And you better have a good relationship with your helping spirits because you're going to need to listen to them. And so I realized that this is way different than psychology. You know, there are no rules here. And you have good relationship and you trust the ones you work with, your angels, your allies, your guardians, your, your ancestral helping spirits. And it becomes, uh, it's not a, it becomes way more than just a conceptual idea of, yeah, I have angels or yes, my ancestors watch over me. It's like you see real and palpable conversational evidence of, of how, how they're making a difference in our lives, the well ancestors. Um, so it's, uh, it's, I changed my entire career from doing psychotherapy to doing divination work as, as far as how I see people. I do other, many other things actually than divination, but since we're focusing on that. Um, and so I wanted to share with you uh, kind of my process with it, where it came from for me. Um, passed down to Melodoma and Burkina Faso from his grandfather and his uncle to him, and then from him to me. Um, and then the things I learned from my other teacher, Will Rocking Bear of the Cherokee Nation, about doing this kind of work in his way. And then, you know, 30, 25 years of, of intuitive psychotherapy practice where I didn't realize that I was actually drawing upon some of the same skill sets. And what I realized when I teach people and talk with people, when you find the thing that whatever it is that you do out there, whatever the thing you do that you do really well and you've done for a long time, if you look at it, you'll see that a lot of times you are operating intuitively and that the information that comes through to you doesn't always come from your memory or your experience. It comes from somewhere else. It can come from the energetic field of with you and the person you're working with. Uh, it can be a symbolic representation of something, or it can be a literal. It can be specific to time and space or be outside of time and space, like from another timeline or another place that it's coming through. Um, and your channels of assimilating uh, these uh, using what, what Barbara Brennan would call high sense perception, your channels of, of assimilating information in these non-ordinary ways doesn't just come through sight. It is, uh, people tend to overemphasize that one. Um, it can come through your physical body where you'll get a, a, a felt sense in your body. Um, it can come through something you hear, something you smell, or something you see, a uh, yeah, taste. Um, it comes through any of the senses, but it comes through at a, at a higher sensory level of awareness, a non-ordinary transmission that's not anchored in the physical realm. Um, and as you learn to trust and, and, and uh, even practice that information by sharing it, you'll learn that that's like, oh, there's, there's actually information here in the energetic field that you can tap into, that you can relate, or some information that comes from another source. Um, and so it becomes a muscle simply that you practice and you deepen into these relationships and understandings. Um, it's kind of like demystifying what is quite amazing at the same time. Um, and it becomes kind of regular. Uh, in that way. Um, but it also requires one to hold to a higher standard of integrity and responsibility and, and ethics. Like uh, when I learned from my Cherokee teacher, he said, unless someone gives you permission, you do not go into their energy field to do anything, not look, not meddle, not benevolently, codependently try and do something for them. You don't have permission, you don't do it. He said, if they're seven years or older, they can give you that permission. If they're younger than seven, then someone that cares for them can, can give you that permission. Um, so I also believe in a, a, a strong ethics to uh, the practice of um, remote tracking, remote viewing and reading and, and offering information. Um, you know, don't do readings for somebody about somebody else. It's, it's like, again, I use the same ethics often as we do in, in psychology. It's like, 
I'm not going to talk, talk to you about somebody else and what's going on with them, um, but I'll talk to you about what's going on with you in relation to them. Um, unless something comes in for to be said. Um, but it's not, uh, sometimes I'll have people call and they want to do a reading about somebody else. And it's like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so there's a, um, so that's the other pieces I've learned is um, this way of ethics. And, and as I was saying, when you're beginning to practice and, and discern this information and how you, how you particularly assimilate these higher senses of perception, um, and what channels it moves through to you specifically, and you you strengthen that. Um, there is uh, uh, the question I tell my my apprentices is um, keep this question in your back pocket. And the question is, in regard to anything you think, feel, emotionally or physically or see, images, any of that information that comes through your through your sensory organs of perception, ask the question, is that mine? And remember when I first learned that I, I used to operate as if it was all mine because it was in my head or in my experience. And then I realized, well, that's not necessarily true. And so that was became the first kind of differentiating, is that mine? And if it felt like a clear no, then whose is it and where is it coming from? And because I'm receiving it, what am I to do with it? Um, because that's another, people that are highly empathic, um, I'm sure some of you out there, that don't feel like you have a way to kind of close the door and open the door. It feels like the door is wide open all the time and you're just kind of getting bombarded with um, psychic residues of information from other people um, and overwhelming you. Um, it's, it's important to develop a, you know, good energy maintenance and be able to actually close the door when you don't want that to happen and, and open it. So for me, when I do divination, I'm opening the door, but when I'm you know, out with the family on vacation, I don't necessarily wanna be reading everything going on with people around me um, unless uh, you know, they ask me to turn my attention. So there's, a, there's that kind of way of taking care of yourself too. Um, and some people need uh, more assistance in developing those kind of uh, energetic boundaries. So they're not just constantly bombarded with uh, this, this psychic en energy that's floating around um, that they're just picking up because they're sensitive that way um, and learn how to use it as a, as a, a medicine tool um, that you can employ in your life. Um, so um, we're going to do a few divinations, um, but I'll take a few questions um, before we dive into some actual divination. Um, so if you have a question, um, maybe do you know how to raise your hand on this thing? Um, and I'm looking on page, I'll flip over to page two, see if anybody's raising their hand. Um, or if you have a question, since, oh, there's one. Okay, Shoshona, it's the first one. What's your question, please? You have to unmute though. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, yeah, this is fascinating. I love this. Um, so my question is, I, I deal in the shamanic realm as well, but I was wondering um, how you deal with unwell ancestors. <laughs> Do you do the healing work while you're in this situation so you can move on with them? Or um, do you just deal with your situation and know that they're not well? <laughs> you know? um, it was funny. I had, the, I had kind of the reactionary response was, I don't deal with unwell ancestors. <laughs> really? Really? I don't mean I don't deal with them. I don't mm -hmm. engage them in the remedy. Oh, okay. I will... Um, uh, with the assistance of the person, we will call on their well ancestors. When I call, we call on the well ancestors, the bright and shining ones, the ones that lived well and died well, further down the line that are well in spirit. Mm -hmm. And between us and those ones, we will assist the one in, in between that's troubled. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, nor do I recommend working directly with the unwell to an activate a remedy for them. 
Mm -hmm. um, but to call on their their lights, as it could be said, or their well ancestors to to come and assist um, in transitioning them. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that. Um, that's often the most common thing. As a shamanic practitioner, you realize, realize that's the most common dilemma people have are the unwell dead that are still roaming about, you know, trying to get people with a physical body to resolve something for them. And right. the litmus test for others that may not know this, I say the litmus test between the unwell and the well ancestors is the well ancestors don't need anything from you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so if you run into uh, uh, an an uh, what you may uh, unknowingly think of as an ancestor, but it's just an unwell dead, if you run into, and even if they're benevolent, because it's like mm -hmm. everybody, there's all kinds of people right. living and dead. So even if they're benevolently unwell and well-meaning, <laughs> um, the, there's a tendency that they have a laundry list of things for you to do on their behalf. And that's your oh. first clue that you're not dealing with a well one. And you can say, thank you, I'm gonna come back to you and we're gonna go you know, further back down the line here or just go, there's ways of doing a journey straight to the realm of the ancestral helping spirits. And so what I do with people when that comes up in a divination, there's, there's an ancestral line clearing ritual mm -hmm. that I will teach the, the person to do. Um, that first has to do with doing a journey. Right. A particular line, um, mm -hmm. not a middle world journey. I, I, I prefer to go straight to the upper world and do an ancestor, to go to the realm of the ancestral helping spirits. Mm -hmm. Once you're there, I say, speak your name. And then speak, if it's your, in your mother's line, say, speak your name and say, I am the son of, and then speak your mother's name. I am the grandson of, speak your mother's mother's name. So you've identified a lineage. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wish to, uh, I wish to meet with uh, one of my, my ancient grandmothers of this line that is well in spirit and connected to the blessings and the medicine of this line. Because every, mm -hmm. all of our lines have particular medicine and blessing that often gets interrupted through trauma, through, through dislocation, through all kinds of addiction, like all the different reasons. Yeah. Um, and so the healing of a line is to connect first through journey. Right. Once the journey's done, then we, uh, I believe in like m making the ritual in the physical realm. So there's a physical ritual that I recommend. It's quite detailed. I won't go into it now for this particular mm -hmm. thing. But in that ritual prescription they then once they have that relationship call upon that well grandmother specifically for that line into the ritual to do to work together to heal what's between them and and this grand, ancient grandmother um, to yeah. do the work of healing okay um, we do um the river of blood are you mm -hmm. familiar with the river of blood in the crystalline boat and we bring in uh, our ancestors into right. the boat. they get healed and then you put them back out you know, after they're healed. Okay. So I was just wondering how you did that. It's, it's such important work because, you know, oh, it is. you just have to look around. It's a mess, you know, <laughs> you're just on it all the time, clearing and cl hoping and clearing. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a funny conversation to sit around with, with people like some of us, because I'll, I'll be sitting in a restaurant and I'll say, you know, just for fun, I'm going to shift my attention and I'm just going to look with, with eyes of kind of seeing who else is in the room and see all kind of dead people just hanging around. Um, I mean, I had a had an experience one time of working with a um, uh, the 17 year old coming to this wilderness recovery center. And, um, and I met with the mom and dad before I even met the kid. And they said, well, you know, our son was doing great up until this year or recently. Um, he was on the soccer team, you know, his girlfriend, he had social clubs, he was in sports, like everything. It's like he was just doing wonderful. And he turned 17 and he plummeted and got involved in drugs. And and they said, we don't know of any trauma. We don't know if anything happened. And so I got suspicious there. It's like something else is going on here. Right. So it's a way of shifting attention to just open awareness to seeing something else and so beside mom who was sitting in front of me I saw an old man who uh, spirit that's great and then sitting beside dad I saw another old man spirit mm. who got curious who they were in relation mm -hmm. to what was going on here mm -hmm. and but I couldn't ask you know this I wasn't that 
they weren't coming to me for that kind of information. So I just said, tell me what life was like for you when you were around your son's age. Mm -hmm. um, and they both, and they told me about their mom and their grandmother. So, well, tell me about your dad and your granddad. Oh, um, my dad committed suicide when I was 18. So, oh, oh, okay. So now I know who this one is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the head drops. We talked about that a little bit. And I turned toward the other parent, asked the same thing. Turns out her grandfather committed suicide when her dad was the age of the kid is now. And they would tell the kid, you, you know, you are a lot like your granddad. And the kid told me later, I hate it when they tell me that. And so what I realized is not only is there this, uh, this uh, unprocessed grief mm -hmm. and, and now these unwell spirits that are just, you know, they haven't been grieved, they haven't left. Right. And now they're kind of latched onto this 17 year old kid at this particular age. Um, and now he's depressed. Um, and yeah. so some of the work I would do behind the scenes with mm -hmm. the with the dead, but other is just grief work. We're going to talk about this. We need to feel this. We need to. And as they did, they healed. Um, That's great. That's great. That's Especially one of those suicide. examples of, of uh, um, you know, the psychopomp work, we would call it. Yeah. yeah. The best. Any other questions? Let me get to some others thank here. You. Pauline, thank you. Shoshona. Where'd Pauline go? Oh, uh, Hi. Hi, thank there you, you so much. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for everything. Um, my question is uh, around, clo you mentioned closing the door when you're um, kind of absorbing a lot of emotions that don't belong to you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I try to imagine like a golden light around me, but I'm, I'm curious what you would, when you said closing the door, what you would recommend? Um. Well, sometimes literally, like if you have an ancestor shrine in your house, I always recommend having a door on it. So when you go in the room, it's just not like wide open. Um, and uh, so that's literally sometimes I mean a door. You, you close it and you open it. You sit down, open it, and you engage. And when you're done, you close mm -hmm. it, go about your day. Um, but uh, do like look, if there's an inability to... Uh, uh, govern the kind of information that comes in. I would even like if you have difficulty doing that, that would be a divination kind of question. Um, like I had a person one time that presented that and they had this, um, they felt visited by spirits a lot and they also had this strange feeling about death all the time. And when mm -hmm. we, what came up is that there was a tear in their auric field that was like wide open. Um, and so it gave access to energies and entities that uh, that were unwelcome. And so we mm -hmm. went and, and attend to their field and close that up. So sometimes the opening can be in the auric field. It can come through trauma. People that have been traumatized um, can often have a tear and a, and a rupture in their um, in the energy field in certain places that allows uh, where their field is very um, mutable. It's like, it's, it's, it's not very strong um, or it's very up against their skin and it's not very like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to strengthen through particular elemental rituals, way to strengthen your field and through energy practices to, to strengthen that. And sometimes it requires healing. Like you have to deal with the uh, the traumas and the things that caused it in order to heal it, even if they came from another time. Because um, sometimes that's the case. They weren't from this timeline. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and then the other thing about, um, I'll just say this because it's a common misperception. Um, people talk about shielding energy. Um, it's, it's shielding, using shielding kind of an energy shield as an immediate, it's good for uh, when you need to do something immediately to create an energetic shield with your, uh, with your intent, your focus. You can do that with your energy field. Um, but you don't want to walk around like that because then nothing gets through. Um, and better practices are actually earth rituals. And, and deepening relationship with earth and that kind of ground and that kind of energy. <clears throat> and it, it is much more of a, a clear and centered protective 
presence than walking around kind of all, all guarded and shielded. Um, so I just, just came to mind that I mentioned. Yeah. Thank you so much. So they'll turn a hand up. Uh, Blair. Hi. Um, I was wondering in this tradition of divination, is there any preparation or um, process to go through or mantra or meditation to make you more open to the information coming through? <clears throat> yes, invocation. Each time I begin a, divina uh, a divination reading, I, I speak an invocation. Um, in the invocation, you'll hear me do it in just a moment. Um, <laughs> But it's the invocation that invites in the sources of wisdom and clarity and guidance that me as just as a regular person doesn't have access to. Um, and it's kind of like in the, in the realm of uh, the, the thing that differentiates a shamanic practitioner from all the other forms of healing practitioners much of the time is their relationship with their allies that that's kind of who does the work. Yeah. And so these things become uh, crucial. Um, so your own self-importance doesn't kind of get in the way. It's uh, one of those Carlos Castaneda teachings, the only adversary of the spiritual warrior self-importance and self-importance has a lot of tricky surprise uh, faces. Um, and so it's always, you know, humbly asking for help and guidance to do what, what is being asked of us to do and, and calling that in, which we'll do in just a moment. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any other questions. If there is one and I'm not seeing it, you might unmute yourself and just ask. Okay. Um, so. I, I have one quick want, question. Hi, Katie. Yes. Um, I was just curious um, about how one arrives at the uh, the ritual prescriptions, if that's uh, something that you read in the cowrie shells or is it um, formulaic based on understanding of the elements? Or just Yes and yes. Um, so when, I, when doing divination, I arrive at the ritual prescriptions by um, the information that I'm saying. And I'll say, and I'm going to turn again the computer down at the divination spread. And there are layers of information. The one I told you, when, like when this is sitting next to this and next to this, there's a conversation. So I read the conversation. That's like the surface layer. That's just knowing that when the ancestor stone sitting in mineral, it means this. You know, that's like having a, a deck of medicine cards and you go read what it says and this is what it means. The other is that there's information that flows through that's not so much related to that, but it's just starting to move through and you just start saying it. Um, and that comes more from your relationship with the spread than kind of a, a definitive, this means this kind of approach. Um, when it comes to the ritual prescriptions, I typically draw those out from uh, after we go through enough of the reading and see what's going on, I can see, oh, there's, okay, so water rituals needed here, an ancestor ritual here, um, an earth ritual here, um, and always looking for connecting lines, like how are these all, all these things connected, and maybe there's some something there, or maybe they're individual rituals, but it comes out of the information and in the spread. Um, when I'm talking with somebody, no, no uh, divination spread available. And I'm using my awareness of the medicine wheel as I work with it. Um, I'm listening to their story and I'm, I'm mapping them into the wheel based on what they're telling me and seeing where their challenges are based on the information I'm hearing. And then based on that, I could offer a relevant ritual prescription based on that particular challenge that would address that and it comes from kind of having that information that's a little more uh systemically uh, organized and, and it's like oh when you're when you're at this particular gatekeeper between the north and the east it's going to be typically this kind of ritual related to the earth or air or mineral um, and it will be about these things typically um 
And so that's a little different than, than the ones that are prescribed through divination, because this is just, it, it really just kind of comes up and you say what, we'll say what you see. Okay. Thank you for giving some insight. Into that. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's, let's jump to this. Um, so I don't know how to do this uh, in a in a random way. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so y'all are all kind of. Uh, um, well, I don't know if anybody that would assume that everybody wanted one. You know, just randomly pick. I don't know if that's true. So if you don't want one, if you want to just watch, um, I'm going to go to page two and I'm going to scan across to the third person from my left, whoever that is, and. And we'll start there. And if you don't want one, H.O., it's uh, we're back to Shoshona. Here are my third person coming across from the left. There you go. I would love it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So if y'all quit switch over to speaker view, if you're not already there. And um, Shoshona, when is your uh, switch my spread here so I can see? OK, um, when is your birthday? November 4th, 1951. I'm a water, I guess. November 4, 51. November 4, October, November, October, November. Just kind of let that settle in. Yeah, in their system, you would be in the water clan. I wasn't born in 51. I'm just, um, and then speak your full birth name so I can hear it. Susan Dale Barnett. Susan Dale Barnett. Okay. All right, so I'm going to skip over all the information I shared because that's often how I begin a divination, but just describing some of the things I already did. And um, so now we'll do invocations. A little fire here. Bear with me a minute. Got to get a little smoke going. Oh. Mm. Yeah, creator, great spirit, great mystery, would come to you this day with open hearts, with humble hearts, and with clear hearts. We call upon your divine love, your divine wisdom, and your divine guidance, and ask that you open the way for this divination to unfold. <clears throat> with much gratitude, we begin. And with much gratitude, we also acknowledge those well-medicine diviners, those ancestral medicine diviners that are well in spirit of the Dogler tribe of West Africa. <clears throat> and we thank you for carrying this ancient medicine, this old way of seeing and guiding and listening and guiding your people and passing it down across the generations and seasons and passing it down to Melbourne's grandfather and to his uncle and to him so that we can come here this day and ask for your assistance. And thank you, Melodoma, for being on the other side. I'm grateful to have you there, my friend. Please help us to see what we alone cannot see and help us to hear what we alone cannot hear. And help us to speak those words that need to be spoken this day with much gratitude. We welcome you. Ashe. We acknowledge the fire clan people, the water clan people, the earth clan people, the mineral clan people, and the nature clan people. And we call upon your elemental wisdom and guidance and ask that you offer up any ritual prescriptions that would assist Shoshona at this time in her life to know where to turn her head next and put her feet next to remove any obstacles internal or external to delivery of the medicine that is to be activated and delivered at this time in our life. With much gratitude, we acknowledge and we welcome you, our elemental ancestors. Ashe. And I call upon my ancestral helping spirits, those of my lineage that lived well and died well, and those that are well in spirit that carry this particular medicine. For my upper world teachers and lower world guides and other allies, guardians, and spirit helpers that assist me in this work, Tingan, Timbalu, Wedame, and Barrow, Genius, and Kumpumlis, thank you for your assistance. Thank you for helping me to see what I alone cannot see and helping me to hear what I alone cannot hear. 
and to speak that which needs to be spoken this day with much gratitude. I acknowledge and I welcome you. Ashe. And we call upon Shoshona's ancestral helping spirits, those in her lineage that lived well and died well, and those that are well in spirit, those ancient grandmothers and grandfathers of her line. And we invite you to this table, to this divination, to sit beside your granddaughter and whisper in her ears those things that you would have her know at this time, to guide her with your love, your wisdom, your compassion. We also talk to Shoshona's upper world teachers and lower world guides and other allies, guardians, and spirit helpers that walk with this woman and assist her in the delivery of the medicine that she came into this world to deliver. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Ashe. Put that down. I'm going to check in with the shells, see if we can begin. And we got a, a big yes. All right, so Shoshana, I'm going to place my hands here and I'm going to spin these shells and within just a couple of seconds or so, you say, tell me when to stop, okay? Okay. Um, and maybe you tell you what, before I spin them, tell me uh, what, uh, a couple of questions, what, do you, what, do you, what is your inquiry about? I would say at this time in my life, I'm wanting to know how to serve humanity more okay what my role is in that experience okay uh, all right so just tell me when to stop and say it kind of loud because these shells are louder on my end and i might not hear okay. you all right here we go okay all right um <clears throat> so we first look toward the figurine and the figurine is here, and that represents the divinity, which is you. Um, and you are mostly um, in a face-up position, um, which is a it's a, a positive position. When I say it's a position of openness, where face down, it's kind of like uh, animals. When an animal rolls over on its belly it indicates a, uh, an openness, a trust. Um, and so when the figurine is belly up, we say there's an openness, there's a trust in this process here. Um, and then I start reading the conversation around the figurine. Um, and I notice, uh, immediately I notice this uh, bone here. And this particular bone is a, uh, it's a inner ear bone from a seal off the north northeast coast of Scotland. And it represents deep listening. Um, we could almost say uh, uh, a clara audient, uh, deep kind of listening. Um, and in particular, we're talking about listening. Uh, this thread here is your maternal grandmother line. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I say that, I'm not saying your grandmother. I just mean this line of grandmothers. Um, and so there's uh, uh, a deep listening uh, being asked of like, listen deeply to these grandmothers, listen deeply to the, to the blessings and the medicine that flow through that particular line. Mm -hmm. um, and what's moving to you about that at this time in your life in terms of how to, to serve humanity. Um, the other things I'm seeing around the figurine um, underneath the figurine is a ring and I'm going to prop it up. Maybe you can see it gently. If I can you see that bit of a ring there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, sorry. Can you do that yeah. again? So there's a ring right here. Oh, okay. just went around you. So, okay. Um, so it's, it was visible to me, but I'm going to put that back where it was. Um, because the, the figurine is, um, intersecting with the ring as you saw it kind of looped around the head of the figurine mm -hmm. that particular ring is relationship with another in the physical and while it does not indicate the type of relationship um, it does indicate a significant uh, uh, relationship and one that is uh, in connection with this particular conversation um, and so it's uh it may be a partner, not real clear yet. I, I would need to see more of what's going on in the spread, but definitely a, 
uh, a teacher, a guide, a partner, um, but there's relevant, uh, the relationship with this person um, enhances, supports this conversation, this exploration here with these grandmothers. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing um, I'm noticing uh, around the figurine here at the base of your feet is a, a ring. This ring is relationship to self. Um, and um, it is uh, it is wrapped around uh, a sword. Now this so interesting, this sword, speaking of Scotland, this sword too is from Scotland, but it's it, it, beyond its geographical origins, it is about uh, truth, about like if the figurine were to roll completely over, the sword would be at your back. Um, and so there's a, an aspect of um, uh, the courage to stand in, in to stand fully in your self sovereignty, your self agency, as a as an elder, um, to trust in that, to really own, to to claim that, to to really just step into that, um, and that there's this alignment at your back um, with the sword, and the sword being facing up, it is a an expressive. Um, so it's a more of an action oriented um, direction. Uh, but essentially your uh, your your question about serving humanity is um, more about just really dropping into the the elder that you are um, and speaking, um, and, and teaching and coming from that particular place. Um, there is connection um, as well. Uh, some, something about connection to um, the sea and the kind of sea, um, seeing maybe in, um, I'm seeing clear waters like Caribbean colored waters, blue, green. There's a, um, uh, there's a, uh, maybe an ancestral connection because it's ancestor stone here, but this piece here, this piece of driftwood here comes from the, um, the island of Kauai. <laughs> um, and it is the side of, you know, if you, if you know that mountain range there, there is, um, a, uh, the Dalai Lama says is one side of the mountain range is where spirits enter this world and the other side is where they leave this world. And this is associated with one that has left this world, but was connected there because I saw this kind of, again, it's kind of a, I know often in Hawaii you see the deep blue water and somehow I'm seeing um, very much kind of a Caribbean looking type of water associated with this piece of coral. Um, but your relationship to yourself is connected with this particular ancestral connection and relationship. I would say one that carried a similar medicine. Um, and uh, maybe connection to that land. There is a, um, yeah, I'm just looking at that further conversation here. Um, your medicine, charcoal represents the medicine you're born with. Um, and um, there is, uh, which is here. And we'd say it's, there's some earth energy associated with it. Do you have children? No. Okay. Do you work with children? I have. Um, is there a, a, a child that was um, lost or died that somehow impacted your life in some way? I had two ectopic pregnancies. Um, this uh, upside down dragonfly is a um, an ancestor, a specific ancestor spirit. Um, but it's uh, the fact that it's upside down would say it needs some attention. Um, the the uh, piece here that's open um, geode um, is. Uh, represents children. Um, 
but the child themselves is okay. There's something here that's uh, uh, a particular ancestor spirit that's connected to the medicine you carry that needs some attention. Um, the good thing about it is that you have this bone here. This is actually the bone I spoke of when we first began. This bone is from a shrine in the village called Barrow, and it is the protector of the guard, it's the guardian of the delivery of medicine. So it's like when this shows up next to medicine, there's a, an assurance that you're going to do what you came here to do. Um, that's its, its purpose. Um, and so, um, your medicine here is also connected to, um, there's the, the medicine that flows through your maternal grandfather line, which is this one. Um, there's some disturbance in that line that needs attention to really open the flow of that medicine. Okay. Um, not sure yet what it is other than this is this one is presented in a disrupted state and is connected to your medicine and is connected to that uh, maternal grandfather line. Um, and uh, so let me just scan a little further. Um, this isn't a full reading because a full reading is like an hour and a half. So I'm just giving you snippets and then we're going to just pause and go with what we've got. Thank you. Um, there is, uh, <clears throat> well, the presence of obstacle. This is the obstacle stone. It's sitting over here in the realm of mineral, which mostly you are as well. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, and mineral is the place of information communication. Um, there's uh, some interference with a new story that's wanting to unfold, a new story that's connected to quite of an expansiveness, which is this piece here. Um, this is the new story stone, and so obstacle sitting in mineral connected to this. So there's some there's some interference uh, with the the awakening of this new story, the the opening of this new story. Um, and it's at a threshold. This is the threshold stone or what we call the vision quest stone, which re represents a threshold. Um, and so I'd say there's, there's uh, important information here that is related to your medicine, again, charcoal, um, to be activated, to be accessed. I'm guessing it's probably connected here with these grandmothers. Um, and I think all that's needed is just to to open the dialogue um, and begin to journey and connect with these ones. Um, if I see the obstacle, what it seems to be related to is, um, you know, we talked about clear audience. There is a um, something that's not seen here. Um, this is what we call the smoking mirror stone. It's upside down. It looks like that on the other side, so it's perfectly clear. Um, when it's face down, it indicates something that's not being seen. When it's face up, it means a deep sight, like availability of that sight. So there's something of information here that's not quite uh, seen. Um, and there is a, uh, a relationship with, um, let's say, an indigenous ancestor. Um, and there might even be a connection to one in this life. And the reason for that we have an airhead here and there's another ring here that calls attention to this area. Um, and so it may speak of relationship with one now, but the one that really calls my attention is this ring here. This is an ancestor ring. And this is a quartz arrowhead. And so the conversation here is that there is a relationship with ancestors that is, uh, is um, connected here with these indigenous ones. Um, and there's disappointment uh, associated with somewhere in that line because of this piece here, it's a, it represents disappointment. Um, something of a disappointment of a uh, of an entire I would say clan could be village because this is a clan pin that's upside down. Um, something of a um, both a relationship with an indigenous and a disappointment is also connected here with a paternal grandmother line. 
um, and uh, where there may have been involved uh, travel. Do you have any um, connection to the Trail of Tears situation with the Cherokee? Not that I know of. My grandparents on that side were Russian, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I yeah, I have a teacher in the upper world who is Native American. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a, an ally and relationship with ancestors. The ring represents relationship with ancestors, and the fact that this is in there, it means they serve in that. Uh, could be like soul ancestor. Um, but definitely there's a connection here with these particular grandmothers. I don't know if it's yet. I have to read more. If there's there's something about this disappointment, maybe assisting and healing something of a disappointment there with those grandmas, something that happened associated with travel, maybe moving from one land to another. This is about travel. Mm. Um, and let me just quickly see if anything else jumps out to say... Um, so that's enough. I'm not going to go into any more information, but I would say the ritual prescription that I see would definitely be um, because this this uh, line of maternal grandmothers here, and we're talking about connection to this deep listening um, as a resource uh, to really deepen into that connection as a place of guidance. It connects over here to the realm of the ancestors. Um, and then this uh, capacity of how you are to serve humanity, this relationship to yourself that again goes back and anchors here. The, the, the blue green water is like um, extremely vivid. Like it's not a thought, it's actually a, it's like I'm seeing it. Um, almost can smell the salt water. Yeah. Um, and then as I say, there's something here uh, being spoken of this uh, place where the spirits leave the world in Kauai. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I would say the, you know, the primary ritual prescription uh, for guidance would be to access this particular lineage of grandmothers to okay. um, deepen into your understanding of the medicine and the blessing that flows through that line is something that's to, something to deeply listen to at this time. Thank um, you. So I'm going to pause. You say anything that has come up for you. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I do work with ancient grandmothers, actually, and um, I understand that deeply. I have lived in Hawaii, and I have lived in the Caribbean. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah, that's, I was thinking that, I mean, I saw this from, from Kauai, and it's like, but I'm seeing blue, green water. There's something here um, that's deeply connected to your relationship to yourself. I did a lot of psychopump work in St. John because of all the people who were killed during the sugar mill situation with the Dutch. Yeah. Yes. I could see the jumbies everywhere. And I psychopumped seemingly forever out mm -hmm. there. It was very mm -hmm. distressing, you know, to see them, those spirits out there. Um, and that was in St. John in the Caribbean. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it was that a lot, but it was a very spiritual. I am kind of clear audio as well i do listen right. to my grandmothers mm -hmm. um so that was beautiful um thank you and i will go journey for them more i'm wondering if it's about i do storytelling and mm -hmm. i write stories and i'm wondering if they want their stories to be told well that's the thing here there's this is all in minerals so it's about information flow communication within the world between the worlds into the world so there's the fact that you're lying in the mineral, but the, what's coming to you is sourced from the ancestral realm, but here you are in the mineral realm, um, it's definitely the focus. So um, there's one other piece that actually speaks even more um, directly to writing. Um, yes, okay. So this stone here is what's called a script stone. Mm -hmm. um, funnily enough, it's in water. So anything in water is, a, is about it. We'd say it's in healing, in need of healing, or offering healing. Um, and so the script stone is in water connected to a piece of sea glass, which takes me to the shore, to the sea. Um, and in this case, over here, when I said obstacles seems to be um, impacting this new story from, from evolving, from coming out, something to be something not seen here that needs to be seen. 
when I look and see that the old story stone is connected here to the script stone, um, in this context, old story means old stories to, to script, to write, to, to, to something to be acknowledged and seen about the old stories that needs to be told that's going to bring healing. Um, that's that really sense? appropriate. I have a writing group and my people that I manage this group for talk about how healing being able to write their stories are. So mm -hmm. I think that's part of my work is managing other people to help their stories come out as well as a healing. Yeah. Right. And, the, and the, the, the old stories are not there. Um, yeah. There are things that need to be seen and acknowledged about these old stories. And, and so as a, as a shamanic practitioner, pay attention to places of obstacle that interfere okay. with that. Okay. Um, and also sourcing the guidance and the direction from the grandmothers, as we indicated here, will um, will help uh, remove that obstacle. Um, and also, when I said you have the um, you have this bone, which is the protection of the delivery of medicine, um, right here. Um, so it's it means you're going to do it. It means that there'll be some things to overcome. Thank um, you. obstacles to overcome but but is but stick with it okay mm -hmm. thank you so much this is really welcome. wonderful you're it was wonderful thank you very yeah, moving do, uh, where we are with time oh we're just a little bit over and i tend to go over all the time so i will do another really quick one um let me pull up everybody's uh, uh the gallery view all right so this time let's choose somebody from page one on my screen, Shoshona, give me a number one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five. So there's 25 people here on each screen. So um, give me a number between one and five, Shoshona. Three. Three. Another three. So that would be uh, three across or three down? Get specific. Um, three down. So that is Bev. Bev, I think you and I might have talked before. Have yes, we ever we done have. this before? <laughs> have I we ever have done a divination done before? No, never, but I have uh I've met you in different things on online. Okay. So um so and before we are you are you open to a really quick reading? Okay. So first we want to offer gratitude to um Shishana's ancestral helping spirits, her allies and guardians that assisted in this divination. And we release you now from this divination with our blessing for your journey and we wish you well. And we call upon Bev's ancestral helping spirits, those in her lineage that lived well and died well, and her upper world teachers and lower world guides and other allies, guardians and angels that assist this woman and being the amazing, beautiful person that she is and how to step more fully into that at this stage of her life. So I'm gonna push the shells back together. Turn the screen back down there. Again, going, I'm gonna shift back over to the speaker view because that's the easiest way for me to see everything. Okay. Okay, Bev. So what would you like to inquire and investigate, Bev? Um, I'm considering moving from this small town to a larger town and moving is kind of a pattern of my life. So moving from a small town to a larger town? Yeah, and it's not real large either, but um, some of the things that I have looked for here, I just have not found. Okay. And also that you're saying that this moving thing and looking for something that you're not finding, that's a pattern or just moving? Yes. Uh, moving. And I do tend to find things eventually, but um, yes, moving is a pattern. Okay. All right. So your, your question or inquiry, if you framed it into a question would be. Um, is this, a uh, this town I'm considering, is this uh, appropriate for the next time, next for this time in my life. 
Okay. So just, you know, in, in doing divinations, you never get a yes, no answer. I know. That's why I know I'm asking. <laughs> yes, so, no so no. yeah. So, so I, we'll, uh, we'll see what comes up, but okay. uh, we'll start to spin the shells. You just tell me when to stop. Okay. okay. Okay, let me get my little pointer here. Um, see where the figurine is. Oh, here you are, right here. Um, definitely, so the figurine is neither face up, which is open and surrendered, or face down, which is closed. Um, interesting, because I would frame this as that you are, you are at a point of decision. You are undecided, because you're on your side. You're not this way or that way. So... You said that, but even if you had not said that, that's kind of the interpretation of the figurine lying on its side is that like at a crossroads, not yet decided um, how to how to open or resist or, or close to this, this place. Um, and as I look around the figurine, start reading, I'm looking kind of underneath to see what you're being supported by. Um, there is, uh, you're lying on the, the nature stone, which is the green. Well, first of all, we'll just say you're in water. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this choice represents a place of uh, bringing potential healing. Um, you're lying on the nature stone underneath you here, um, which also indicates um, a transformational period. Um, so may feel like the transformation is moving you toward the uh, that which is new and unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I see at your feet here is the clan pin and it is face down. So there's some and, and somehow connected to um, a child spirit. Um, and uh, my choice of words, uh, when I say child spirit, I think I actually do mean spirit. Sometimes the, the um, geodes, they always represent children, um, but I don't always, like in the last one, I always say uh, spirit part. The fact that it's connected to a clan pin that's face down, um, there's, there's something here um, of a disconnect between this child spirit and their clan. Mm -hmm. um and uh the fact that i'm saying spirit means before this time now it doesn't mean that it didn't Sorry. replicate itself in this time but there's a disconnection a dissociation from the clan group um and the fact that i'm saying spirit means uh prior to this this life lifetime lifeline um and but there is a wellness here. It's like the, the this, this this child spirit is actually well in state, and they're in search of connection to um, this clan. It's it's like something may have happened to like an entire village, and but the child survived it, and they're in search of something that's uh, maybe not available, um, and. I'm also seeing the deep water stone in water, which is, you know, whenever the elemental stone is sitting in its own element, it's like there's alignment. And the deep water stone is about deep healing. Um, and so this is, uh, um, there's something about this, this choice of transformation or change that can be deeply healing on uh, like uh, multiple lifetime levels. Um, it's not just about this lifetime. Um, there's something about a reconnection or seeking of uh, uh, in a reconnection to a clan group of people, like finding your people would be a way to think about it. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the medicine, uh, let me, I'm called to look at something else here. Let me see if I can find it around the map, around the wheel. Um, so I was drawn here. I was looking for that one for some reason. So this is transformation stone, which it has a relationship for the nature stone because nature is about transformation and change. 
So it, it made me to want to look, see where the transformation stone is. And it's here. And the snake on it is up and visible. So it means that the, the transformation is in play. Um, it, is, uh, it is connected to a, uh, a physical world relationship um, that's also part of this transformation because of this rings connected to it here. And it's, um, maybe look at a couple of things underneath it, see what's lying here. Um, and it's gonna take some courage. Um, there's a stone underneath the transformation stone that has the word courage on it. You may be, remember it from my other story. The courage stone is flipped upside down, meaning we need to, to bring it in more. Um, so having courage uh, to, to walk through this transformation, um, and even though it has this, uh, this impact with this relationship here. Um, which can feel somewhat unsettling, um, uh, but yet having the courage to, to, to move in that direction. Um, and then there's another thing that's associated with the transformation stone. Let me scan and see where that is. Uh, there's a snake vertebrae. So we say when it's, when a snake is up on the transformation stone, I look for the snake vertebrae to see where that is because that's where the medicine is coming to you to assist you. And I find it over here. Um, it's in the realm of the ancestors. It's got an open cowrie shell next to it. Uh, also has a, uh, a water stone, which is about healing, um, which draws my attention back to this, this conversation here. Um, so it's a healing. And for you, the, um, the smoking mirror stone is, is open. It's, it's, uh, we'd say your intuitive sight and, and is a, um, like you can trust your vision. You, you have access to, to deep sight. Um, so to lean in and trust that it's anchored into the realm of the ancestors is where um, it's kind of like you, you see uh, what it is you want to create or where it is you want to be um, and hold that vision, hold that uh, until, until you arrive there. Um, like you can trust that. Um, even if others around you are, are um, uh, causing some kind of second guessing, um, the, uh, the soul, uh, this, this is direction of your soul here is directed more toward your relationship to yourself ring. Um, so this is a, a time, a, a period of life of, of, uh, really deepening into relationship with self. Um, for you too, there is a uh, there's an aspect of the the sea and the ocean that has a um, uh, an uh, an anchoring quality, like feeling at home, like a, a a kind of quality of like you know when I'm at the sea, when I'm at the ocean, it's like a, a feel I feel myself. Yes, I live on the um, coast, and that uh, and that points in like your soul's direction is pointing that way like yes. um going to a place where you have easy access uh uh to yeah. the um let's see what word wants to be said here is it's uh, well it's both when i say the word sea it feels old european the way they would reference they talk about the sea um in more modern society we'd just say ocean um but it feels like a bow. So it feels like, again, there's this parallel other time and this time um, of, of like the sea recognizes you and you recognize the sea, you know each other. Yes. Um, and it's a place of, uh, it's where your soul is carrying you. So if, if one of these choices of, of moving involves that, I would, I, would in, I would point in that direction. Yeah, it does. Um, and um and again, the snake vertebrae sitting here in the realm of the ancestors, my sense is you, you see it, you, you have a vision of it. And it's a vision that has an emotional quality to it. Uh, 
but it may be all the other things could be even a relationship dynamic that might cause some uncertainty, whether it's a work thing or a, a personal thing that, that might cause you to question that uh, clarity of sight, but, you, but you've got it. And it's connected to the new story, it's connected to healing. Um, and it seems to, and the obstacle stone sitting in the realm of the ancestors, it, but all of this is, is uh, affirming, it's like this is what shifts that, kind of moves that out of there. You're, you're being able to do that um, and follow that course. Um, so I'm going to pause. There's, of course, a lot more to say. And as I say, divinations are an hour and a half. Um, so in terms of a ritual prescription, um, you know, trust your sight. That's definitely one thing um, to... Um, envision it uh do you paint yes i do i'm an artist okay um yeah i was seeing you actually paint it like painting your home painting like painting the thing you are looking for oh um, oh because there is a um hmm. this uh your painting is a channeling of um i'm gonna look at you because this is not really on the map it's just something i'm telling you so okay. you're you're painting um i'm trying to see how did i get paint? actually i draw more than i paint but i do both draw paint um mm -hmm. yeah i don't know that was one of those things that i don't it didn't really come out of the spread it just came to me and say do you paint or do you draw but mm -hmm. but sketching drawing painting mm -hmm. um the the vision of the the place that is calling your name so the way to think about it is that your your soul travels out ahead of you in time and space and then it starts sending back the signals and information that you respond to and when you get there you recognize it or you recognize each other and so your your medium of creative expression being painting or drawing it's like just like channel it just drop in and say you know just let it kind of like don't think about it you know just mm -hmm. let it come out on the paper and likely it will be the thing that you end up finding in some way mm -hmm. um is what i'm seeing um, so that would be the ritual prescription one of uh um oh yeah so maybe the transformation in minerals so minerals about information communication so yeah, really trusting your sight and trusting uh, the transmission of information through your creative expression and just start to let it unfold on the canvas or on the sketch pad or, um, and then start following that, looking for, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll know it when you see, see each other kind of thing. But definitely it's, in, it's connected to the sea. Yes, um, and that sea piece has a, healing component in this lifetime but also has this other thing that i was seeing that's that didn't begin this this location from connection to family community didn't start here in this life it, it's earlier but this this somehow um is returning you to the sea is returning to a sense of that anchor to to, to your people we could say so i'm going to pause there i know you've said a couple of things about what's resonating for you but anything else uh um, thing I've said. Well, I was born and raised in an inland place, and and the first time I ever saw the sea, I had a visceral reaction to it. I wanted to live on the coast for forty years, so mm -hmm. I do live on the coast. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at another town uh, on the coast that's a little okay. larger, but that all rings true. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I'll I'll listen to the recording and ponder some more. But yes, it it all. Yeah, I'm actually, and I'm not seeing a house that's actually on the ocean. I'm actually seeing yeah. it's on the channel, the backwater channels, okay. not even the intercoastal, but even kind of some of the tidal creeks that move off the intercoastal, mm -hmm. um, like Southport, North Carolina kind of place, if you know that place. <laughs> well, I'm on the West Coast, so, but yes. But yeah. anyway, that's what yeah. the image I saw. So maybe you'll come I, here I and you'll find it there. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. That. So in wrapping this up, um, thank you all for volunteering to, to be the divination guinea pigs, uh, Shoshana and Beth, and, or Beth. And um, 
So I want to invite you to consider joining us for the divination uh, training, which begins, it's on the website. You can go to our website at uh, rights of www.rights, R-I-T-E-S of passage council.org. Like it's uh, there with my, on my name box. And if you click on programs, you'll see divination training. Again, it's a three session training that begins, um, I think it's at the end of June. I'm not good at remembering the dates once I put them on the website, but there's three of them. Uh, one of them is focused on the elementals and deepening that relationship. One of them is focused on working with ancestors and uh, deep sight and, and activating and, and your, your own intuitive channels of assimilation. And then the third one is actually the creation of, of the divination spread, this whole thing. Um, where you, uh, and then you bring, you know, I'll tell you all the items to bring. And then the last session, we'll put it all together and you'll create your, your canvas and paint on it and, and fuse it with your own uh, feet and hands and, and drawing. And so it's, um, and then activate your spread and then do some practice sessions with both people in the group. And then we'll invite people from the, uh, surrounding community to just come and, and, uh, sit with new diviners and let you do some practicing in the third session. Um, do I have any, I don't know if I have any of my other, uh, I don't think so, any of the other folks that have trained in divination with me from several years back. Um, it's a funny story. I, I did this divination some years ago and I was, um, because a number of people asked and I kept, uh, referring people to melodoma i said well melodoma does his divination he does the training i mean i was just training it with him but if you want to train go train with him and so i would refer people to him and he'd send them back to me and um and we never talked and i thought okay so if you're sending them back to me i'm going to go ahead and do this and um that's my kind of go ahead and then um and then after he died i was people started asking me again about this divination and i said all right, so Maldoma, I need you to come to me and tell me, because I never got to really ask you directly, is it okay for me to begin to teach this? Um, and it was about three months later, he came to me in a dream and we were meeting down here in my medicine room and he's, he came to me to get a divination. I said, okay, that's my permission. So I feel like I've got, I've got permission to do this. Um, there's actually some things I'm gonna, um, while well, I've been doing, working with his particular elemental medicine wheel um, configuration, there's one that I work with. So I'm actually going to blend them and create, um, based on his teachings and my teachings, this, this system of uh, not just the divination part, but the other part that I was telling you where you, you understand the, the, the medicine wheel to such a degree that you can listen to stories and divine ritual prescriptions. So there's that method of, of even if you sit with people one-on-one -on -one as clients, it's applicable in that setting the way you could just, you know, hear your story and see, you know, based on this, I'm hearing your, your challenges is that the Southwest gatekeeper. And I want to recommend this particular uh, ritual prescription related to water, because that's what's in that area related to what they're, what they're going through. So that's another way of uh, divining through just understanding the uh, the elemental, working with the elementals and the ancestors and, and prescribing um, relevant rituals based on where, where somebody's working with. Um, so that begins this summer. And the other thing about the divination train is it is three sessions you'll see. Um, but the first two sessions are also independent, meaning that if you did the full training, you, you'd sign up for all three, or you sign up for the third one, which includes all three. But you could just do the elemental weekend, and you could just do the sacred site activation weekend. They're both, uh, those are the first two before we make the spread. So you can take them independent if you didn't want to do the whole thing. So I just wanted to put that out there and invite you to consider that. And also, um, all the other good stuff that's happening. I've got a, an amazing uh, staff that uh, um, of women that have put together a, a program called Seasons of Womanhood, 
And I'm proud to say it includes my adult daughter and my sister and uh, a couple of other women that put together that program. And it's specifically for um, uh, female identified people that wish to do that one. And that's a, that's a deep experience. Then we have the Vision Quest experience, which is an 11 day encampment. Uh, ancestor grief ritual, which is a standalone experience as well. Um, but yeah, please and please take a look, and I'd love to, to to meet you this summer, hopefully around the fire. So, any last questions? I will hang around for a minute as we sign off. If anybody wants to, to ask a, a closing question uh, specific to any of that, and otherwise, um, thank you um, to. Um, let's say, let me do this as well. I want to offer gratitude to Bev's ancestral helping spirits and her uh, upper world teachers and lower world guides and uh, release them from this divination. So much gratitude to my helping spirits, uh, to the fire clan, the water clan, the earth clan, the mineral clan, and the nature clan ancestors, and to the diviners of the Dogra tribe of West Africa, in particular Melodoma, thank you. Uh, and to Creator, Great Spirit, thank you for opening the way for this uh, conversation to Ashe. So everybody go well, and I will hang here a minute. If there are any questions, you can just unlock your mic and talk. I, I have a question. Are these classes in person or are these over the internet? These are in person, in the elements uh, encampment. It's one of the things I... I love and appreciate the fact we have such amazing technology to do what we're doing here all over the world. Um, and I'm kind of so old school. I, I, if we're going to have a relationship with the elements, we have to get in them. <laughs> and Because uh, I'm very nature connection oriented. So, yeah, maybe sadly or not sadly, they are all in person. And that's, um, that's great. So the divination classes will be because that's what I'd be interested in. Yeah. Yeah. The divination classes are um, camping, although you could stay, you know, at, a, at an Airbnb, but it's best if you actually are camping with us and we have uh, um, beautiful land next to a river and kitchen, outdoor kitchen. So it's um, yeah, but it's it's in the elements. <laughs> okay well let me go i'll go look at that thank you so much Ketter. you're it was quite welcome lovely really nice really to meet you, Shoshana. go well you too many blessings anyone else have a curiosity question yes let me put my glasses back on pete yeah oh. can you hear me i do hear you good to see you good Thanks. to see you again um one thing i was that really helped me was your talk about like the ascent versus the descent mm -hmm. and i'm always trying to like ascend to god and you talked about going like descent mm -hmm. and you mentioned that again here what what do you recommend if someone's interested in descent and how does that i, I guess to relate it to what we're talking about just with um i guess you're sending uh, into the, the pile there so um uh, Elementally, you can think of initiatory arc as having two elemental trajectories. And in mythologies and in, uh, in things where water shows up on the scene and there's a, an immersion into water, we say this is an elemental descent into water, which means you're going to be working with ancestry and healing and remembering and emotion and and it's that kind of a it's it's a it's a descent it's mm -hmm. a initiatory descent and and so water is the elemental uh, um, storyline in many stories where there's a descent mm -hmm. uh, an initiatory ascent is one of fire and it's one of uh uh, when one is, we say, one catches fire with an idea, a passion, something uh, that is driving them. In, in the old way, we'd say you, uh, uh, it's a genie possession. Um, and the thing about these initiatory journeys is that the initiatory descent, we say, if you don't have a good guide, it can kill you. 
And if you and if you're on initiatory ascent and you're on fire and you're just driven with some some blazing idea to manage to create to do to manifest, that's powerful. But if you don't have a, a good guide to help you mitigate that kind of energy, like the descent, it can kill you. And I've seen, you know, in a descent, one could get lost in depression and um, suicidal ideations. And there's a there's a way in which one can get confused because there's often a an initiate well there always is an initiatory death which means something's going to be born and in those kind of descents when people get into that territory where our society tends to pathologize the initiatory or mythological descent when we pathologize it and the person uh, then they don't get the help they need and they get kind of targeted as the problem and and i have seen people you know take themselves out and that kind of thing. And I've seen people in a in an initiatory ascent where they're just on fire to bring this vision to the world. And it wasn't, uh, it just, it just uh, as we say, it's a genie possession. And it just took them and I saw them, they, one person I knew ended up dying in a high-speed motor -like, motorcycle accident. And just for no reason, they were just like, uh, and they were doing so much and offering so much. So these, Elemental uh, arcs of initiatory uh, activation, um, or as Michael Mead says, those that go seeking water, well, they end up in the fire. And those that go seeking the fire, well, they end up in the water. <laughs> so it's, um, but there is an elemental nature to, to these processes. Um, and, and it's always helpful to have a, a guide that's, uh, survived them <laughs> thank you what else anything else uh, can i ask a yeah. question yes um i'm seeing how um you share your story around working uh, in a clinical setting uh as a psychologist and then ending up in this or having a preference for this nature of work um, can you speak to um, what kind of um, potential you would would say those those who are your um, previous students or those considering this course, uh, what kind of path doing this kind of work um, has to offer? What what sort of ways we might interface with helping others, or even how it might change our lives? Um, just anecdotally um, or just um, how you know, practically you want to answer that question? Uh, it's a big question. I would definitely say it's important to do your, do your own work, tend to your own garden. Um, you know, the, the concept of the wounded healer is important because uh, the healer that's not aware of their wounds can be a dangerous healer. Um, and we all got wounds. We all got uh, challenges. So um, doing one's own healing work as a practice, not as a one and done <laughs> retreat or something. Um, but being aware of, uh, you know, in some mythologies, uh, the, the character will walk with a limp. And the reason they walk with a limp is because they, they, they have identified and they know their own woundedness. Um, and so I can't uh, can't overemphasize that the idea that you can't do the work unless you do the work. Um, and in the the training, the divination training, or the quest, it's like the training is real about is really about your deepening your relationship into yourself and into relationship with these these allies and dealing with whatever comes up in your process of doing that. Um, it's less, it's only minutely about how you work with somebody. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody today, I just, you know, on the, what was that movie? The Matrix. And I love that in the Matrix movie, the, the Oracle was an old woman that made chocolate chip cookies. And that above her door, when you went to her apartment, it's, it said the same thing that it says above the, the entrance to, to Delphi, which is know thyself. 
Um, and that's really the practice of, of uh, um, stay humble, stay focused, you know, um, do, do the healing work that you need to do with yourself. And it doesn't mean you have to get to a certain place before you start offering your medicine. The, um, think of this way, the, the crossroads where your passion meets the needs of your people is where you find the most healing and where you have the most healing to offer. And, and accessing that passion requires us to, um, you know, to reconcile um, oftentimes ancestral messages and ways of being that no longer serve us or, or that God is here and we have to shift it or other things that have happened in our lives. So it's, you know, we all, we all come into the world to both bring healing and, and, um, and uh, activate healing for our own ancestral lineages by what we, how we work with that um, is what comes to mind with that question. Anything else before we sign off tonight? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bear. All right, let me switch over to page two, see who's left, all right. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, sometime within the next few days, uh, you'll you'll get an email from my assistant Sarah, who will send you the recording of all of this, so you'll have that. And um, and it's grateful to see you all, and I hope to see you all down the road. Thank so you. everybody, go well, and love and blessings to each of you and your families. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Good night.